Good evening. Could I have your attention, please? We'd like to begin. Good evening. I'm Lois Oppenheim, chair of the program committee. And I trust everyone's had a good summer, a productive summer, and is ready to start off the new academic year at the Institute. We have a very exciting series of scientific program meetings, uh, and I'm really pleased to welcome you this evening to the first of those. Um, we are delighted to have with us tonight Brian Kloppenberg, who will present a paper entitled The Psychoanalytic Mode of Thought and Its Application to the Non-Normative Analysis of Sexuality and Gender. Following his presentation, <clears throat> we will have two discussants, Dr. Rosemary Balsam and Dr. Robert Smith. Brian Kloppenberg is a psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City and a fellow of the International Psychoanalytic Association. He is a member of the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis and an associate member of the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. A training analyst and supervisor at NPAP, he teaches a foundation course on human development, as well as an elective on the work of Hans Lowald. He was director of the Theodore Wright Clinical Center from 2010 to 2012, and dean of training from 2012 to 2014. At IPTAR, Brian Kloppenberg will be teaching a course on the non-normative psychoanalysis of sexuality and gender in early 2015. Most recently, he presented a paper on Lowald, Heidegger, and Lucy Irigaray at the New School for Social Research as part of the Hans Lowald Conference. Brian Kloppenberg. How's that? Can you hear me? Is that good? Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Oppenheim, Dr. Smith, Dr. Balsam, the program committee at New York Psychoanalytic for uh, inviting me here and engaging with my work. So tonight I will begin with some clinical findings drawn from analytic work with several gay men. I have organized these findings into a composite figure that I will call Sean. Sean presented with powerful sexual compulsions that made it impossible for him to find a loving relationship with another man and to develop a more dynamic work life. Having tried various non-analytic therapeutic modalities to quell these compulsions without any success, he turned to psychoanalysis. Over the first few years of the analysis, Sean elaborated a central organizing conflict between his desire to be virtuous and an equally powerful counter desire to make sexual trouble. Sean wished to embody the good, productive citizen who loved and was loved by family, friends, and a partner. At the same time, he could not contain, let alone permanently expel, his sexual urges, urges that he experienced as nasty, out of control, and dangerously seductive. While in his virtuous mode, Sean would do his anxious best to compensate for past and future bad acts. Um, while in his virtuous mode, Sean would do his anxious best to compensate for past and future bad acts of sexual transgression. While in his rebellious mode, Sean would find himself caught up in a driven, dizzying excitement that would ultimately leave him devastated. In both modes, a terrible feeling of fundamental lack was never far off. In exploring the genetic aspect of these dynamics, Sean provided a detailed impression of an early childhood in which he felt a particular bond with his mother. She served for Sean as a model of civility and good taste, and he described himself being devoted to her and very much wanting to please her. In contrast, Sean reported chronic feelings of animosity towards his father, who he experienced as bland and somehow removed. Even though Sean could also look back on his father from a different perspective, one in which his father came across as loving and accepting of his son. 
Sean remembered feeling that his father paled in comparison to some of his father's friends, who struck him as much more powerfully masculine, and how he wished he could have had a father like that. As this process material came into focus, I began to consider the role of a powerful maternal identification in Sean's psychic life, one with the power to foreclose his ability to connect with his father and thereby develop a more integrated sense of himself as masculine. I wondered if Sean's reported fascination with his friend's fathers during his childhood and his compulsive sexual activities during adolescence and adulthood could be understood as efforts to establish a vital link with manhood that had been disrupted by a gratifying yet stultifying maternal object relationship. I wondered if perhaps Sean had suffered from a childhood trauma that had severely derailed the development of his phallic and Oedipal strivings. To what degree, I asked myself, did the crucible of Sean's early childhood experiences affect his sexual orientation? Instead of continuing with my presentation of clinical findings, I now interrupt this unfolding of case material to ask the following questions. What is missing in this seemingly straightforward explication of various formulations about my composite patient, Sean? What I have constructed in the previous paragraphs is a clinical picture of Sean based on various traits and developmental narratives that psychoanalysts have constructed to identify and conceptualize sexuality and gender in gay men. The utilization of traits and developmental narratives to arrive at formulations about the sexualities and genders of our patients is a standard aspect of psychoanalytic clinical practice and the theories that derive from this practice. Furthermore, from Freud's earliest clinical work with his hysterical patients to the present day, analysts have deployed any number of these formulations to interpret mental processes in a variety of effective ways. However, what is missing from my own clinical formulations based on traits and developmental narratives, as well as similar formulations by other analysts, is the crucial inclusion of psychoanalysis as a mode of thought that must incessantly call into question any traits or developmental narratives as necessarily partial and provisional. Without this kind of questioning, formulations about sexuality and gender cease to manifest psychoanalytic thinking and instead take on the normalizing power of received wisdom. It is the aim of this essay to articulate how the application of a particularly psychoanalytic mode of thinking to the categories of sexuality and gender must involve a necessary challenge to the normative ideas and ideals that inevitably imbue these interrelated yet by no means straightforwardly linked categories. In order to do so, a particular take on Freudian theory will be offered that draws upon two interpretive readings. One, Grossman's distillation of Freud's conceptualization of the psychoanalytic mode of thought. And two, Grossman and Kaplan's delineation of three Freudian commentaries on sexuality and gender. Together, these two readings allow for a return to Freudian thinking at its most interrogative and open-ended both in terms of the process of building theory itself, as well as the specific challenges involved in building psychoanalytic theory about sexuality and gender. From these vantage points, it will then be possible to elaborate how and where a certain Freudian psychoanalysis with its non-normative orientation can intersect in a critical manner with various conceptualizations of sexuality and gender. In Totem and Taboo, Freud specifically makes, names the work of comparing, via analogy, the childhood of individual men and the early history of societies as the psychoanalytic mode of thought. Grossman's reading of Totem and Taboo elevates the psychoanalytic mode of thought into a conceptual tool for all forms of psychoanalytic research. He does so by making the crucial argument that we must understand Freud's totem and taboo as part of a larger theoretical project that cannot be divorced from the technical procedures of psychoanalysis. 
In other words, clinical practice and theory building are different, yet interrelated manifestations of the psychoanalytic mode of thought. In utilizing the same conceptual tool to analyze individuals or various anthropological findings, Freud works from a complex understanding of the dynamic relations between present and past that situates both manifest and latent phenomena as well as more advanced and more archaic phenomena within a larger, stratified, hierarchical organization, be that organization mental or societal. Furthermore, Freud's psychoanalytic mode of thought requires a theory of active processes that allow for constant, nonlinear transformations over time within the various strata of a given organization and between multiple organizations. In Freud's vision, the force of recursive translations, both within and between various organizational stratifications, must always be thought concurrently with the counterforce of defensive processes. The inevitable conflicts between these forces and counterforces create the unavoidable psychic tensions of life. The psychoanalytic mode of thought, as discovered by Freud and elaborated by Grossman, takes nothing for granted. Rather, it functions as an ongoing process of gathering up what is available in a given domain of inquiry in order to seek out what is being defended against so as to lay the groundwork for a transformational interpretation. In so doing, the psychoanalytic mode of thought possesses the potential to change fundamentally that which it analyzes. To bring the psychoanalytic mode of thought to bear on sexuality and gender is to gather up the given material in these intersecting domains with the understanding that what is given must eventually yield to interpretation. Freud's own work on sexuality and gender is extraordinarily complex and contradictory. It includes, for example, some of the most powerful transformative interpretations of adult sexuality in its relationship to infantile sexuality, as well as, at various moments, the parroting of received norms about women and homosexuality. Grossman and Kaplan powerfully recontextualize Freud's work on sexuality and gender in terms of three commentaries, taking Freud's numerous formulations about female sexuality as their main focus. Their work elucidates where Freud actually applied the psychoanalytic mode of thought to sexuality and gender and where he did not. They make it possible to read some of Freud's most controversial formulations in a psychoanalytically productive manner. In the process, Grossman and Kaplan apply the psychoanalytic mode of thought to Freud's own work. According to Grossman and Kaplan, the first of Freud's three commentaries amounts to a psychology of traits. And I quote, what we are calling Freud's first commentary consists of a constellation of traits presented as though they were psychoanalytic findings rather than interests, scientific conclusions rather than problems for further research. As such, this first commentary conveys a normative message in which certain stereotypes encountered among infantile ideals and social conventions are underwritten by psychoanalytic authority." Unquote. Thus, the first commentary includes, for example, Freud's categorical descriptions of women as inherently masochistic and passive in his attempt to arrive at the truth of femininity. Rather than trying to create a more accurate or inclusive list of traits to describe various aspects of sexuality and gender, Grossman and Kaplan argue that any psychology of traits fails to reach the status of genuine psychoanalytic inquiry. The dynamic nature of psychoanalysis would take any trait, like a symptom, as the jumping off point for analytic work, not a place to stop. A psychoanalysis of traits and their attendant stereotyped convictions ultimately reveals the psychopathology of conformity rather than supporting it. The second commentary refers to Freud's narratives of female development. Grossman and Kaplan take Freud's thought in this area to task for, quote, its universalization of several 
or even numerous cases in point to a singular history of all women, unquote. They reference Freud's femininity essay in which Freud postulates that all women develop um, along one of three pathways, one leading to massive sexual restraint, another involving fantasy-laden identifications with men, with homosexuality as a possible outcome, and a third involving the development of so-called normal adult femininity. Although there may be some truth in each of these narratives for individual women, it is implausible to expect these three stories to account for the complex variability of individual female development. Grossman and Kaplan go on to point out that Freud's female developmental narratives tend to leave out stranger, complex, or nonlinear aspects of development that the psychoanalytic mode of thought otherwise emphasizes and celebrates elsewhere. Here's another quote. Where crucial nodal points of development, such as the discovery of anatomical sex difference or change of object, are put into a fixed sequence without an account of process, a static linearity occurs that does not correspond to the version of development found under the auspices of the psychoanalytic method." Unquote. The psychoanalytic mode of thought, in contrast, depends upon interpretation and reconstruction to create developmental narratives that allow for individual variability and nonlinear dynamics. Freud's concept of, defer of deferred action, Nachtreglichkeit, serves as an example for a nonlinear approach to developmental thinking. In addition, any particular interpretation and reconstruction must eventually give way to fresh revisions as the psychoanalytic process proceeds. This brings us squarely to Freud's third commentary, which Grossman and Kaplan define as fully psychoanalytic precisely because it cannot be reduced to a psychology of traits or a linear developmental model. For this reason, they argue that we do not become more psychoanalytic in our thinking by providing new lists of traits or new developmental narratives as correctives to Freud's. Rather, we think more psychoanalytically by questioning the normative tendencies that inherently accompany the identification and naturalization of traits and developmental narratives. If there is a place for thinking about traits and developmental schemes, it is to expand our appreciation for, as they put it, the possibility of developmental variability that will emerge in psychoanalytic work. Thinking in terms of variability works against the tendency to overvalue any one event or trait or fantasy or impulse over and above all others that emerge over the course of psychoanalytic work. Thinking in this way about sexuality and gender, a manifestation of the psychoanalytic mode of thought, can be found at several points across Freud's writings. For example, in Freud's case report on homosexuality in a female patient from 1920, which contains many examples of trait psychology and linear developmental thinking, Freud compares the reconstructive power of psychoanalysis with the urge to predict future developmental outcomes based on, quote, premises inferred from the analysis, unquote. Freud recognizes what seems like an, quote, inevitable sequence of events, unquote, from the reconstructive perspective does not necessarily have predictive value. As he puts it, the synthesis is not so satisfactory as the analysis. In other words, from a knowledge of the premises, we could not have foretold the nature of the result, unquote. The power of reconstruction is founded not in its predictive capacity, but rather in its dynamic, provisional role in the analytic process. When Freud writes in Female Sexuality from 1931, quote, it is hardly possible to give a description that has general validity, unquote, he underscores the necessary uncertainty of a psychoanalytic process that is continually, if painfully, open to revision. Not just any kind of revision, however. 
in moving forward to examine more recent psychoanalytic explorations of sexuality and gender, a crucial question will always remain in play. Do these particular revisionist responses to Freud's theories recapitulate his thinking regarding trait and linear developmental narratives? Or do they manifest the psychoanalytic mode of thought? Or do they, like in Freud's own theoretical work, embody a combination of all three commentaries? To summarize and amplify the previous discussion, Freud's psychoanalytic mode of thought calls into question the normative power of gender stereotypes and the predictive foreclosures of static developmental formulations. At the same time, it also undermines the way in which sexuality and gender are often experienced as essential givens about the self. Against the ubiquitous tendencies to take the self as some kind of experiential fact or composite structure, Grossman, in a 1982 paper, applies the psychoanalytic mode of thought to the concept of self. In the process, he reveals the sense of self as a unique form of mental activity organized around highly idiosyncratic fantasies of what it means to be a self. Self as fantasy includes sexuality and gender as phenomena that are not essentially given any more than the self is in Grossman's vision. Grossman draws upon Freud's theory of screen memories in which any memory must be understood as not being from our childhood, but only relating to our childhood. Memory cannot serve as a foundation for psychoanalysis, as any memory will always manifest as a function of compromise involving multiple translations. Likewise, self as fantasy, along with the sexual and gendered aspects of self, are most usefully understood in terms of a dynamic series of relations with the potential to transform in response to psychoanalytic activity. What stands in the way of this vision? Grossman emphasizes the problem of concreteness in his discussion of self as fantasy. He refers to certain narcissistic patients who, in their attempts to delineate an objective view of their boundaries, as Grossman puts it, get caught up in static and lifeless formulations about self and world. Grossman, echoing Freud's interpretation of theoretical systems in Totem and Taboo, suggests that with this kind of narcissistic phenomena, quote, a concrete and ostensibly objective anchor has been found for the projected inner conflicts, unquote. Grossman seeks to free the concept of self from its concrete moorings in disavowed conflict. In the same way, a concretized objectivity about sexuality and gender on both sides of the couch substitutes static and lifeless formulations so as to avoid the intense conflicts aroused by the dynamic complexity of sexual difference, sexual orientations, and gender ambiguities. There is no foundational anchor for analyst or analysand in the face of such complexity, no bedrock or normative ideal. To invoke the term bedrock inevitably references Freud's pointed remarks about penis envy and masculine protest in analysis terminable and interminable. What would it look like to apply the psychoanalytic mode of thought to Freud's late in life pessimism about the analyzability of a man's castration fears in relation to other men? Are there psychosexual phenomena that exist in men beyond what Freud calls the repudiation of femininity? Freud himself seems to think so when he writes that a man's ability to sustain a passive attitude towards another man is in fact indispensable in many relations in life. At the same time, he suggests that for his male patients, this kind of passivity gets equated with a traumatic encounter with the feminine that is tantamount to castration itself. In other words, Freud is unable to help the male patient who, quote, refuses to substitute himself, I'm sorry, refuses to subject himself to a father substitute or to feel indebted to him, the psychoanalyst, for anything. And consequently, he refuses to accept his recovery from the doctor, unquote. 
when Freud concludes his paper with the idea that such convictions are probably indicative of psychical bedrock having been reached, he effectively forecloses an understanding of the repudiation of femininity in men as a problem for further psychoanalytic research and instead concretizes his clinical impasses as scientific conclusions. A close reading of these passages from Analysis Terminable and Interminable suggests a tension between what Freud calls the indispensable passive element in certain male relationships and what he calls, in reference to his disputes with Adler, the psychical bedrock of masculine protest. Rather than taking up this tension as a recourse for a psychoanalytic exploration in the repudiation of femininity in men, numerous psychoanalysts since Freud have recapitulated his concretized thinking of men, masculinity, and male sexuality. To cite one example that speaks to a familiar psychoanalytic trope, Chassegue Schmirgel locates great danger in a young boy's relationship to his mother and her potentially engulfing femininity. Without a repudiating counterforce, the boy will fail to develop into a functionally masculine heterosexual man. Chassegue Schmirgel, like many other analysts, fails to notice Freud's glancing interest in the facilitating aspects of femininity and passivity in men. Instead, she reinforces his hasty conclusions in this area, confining her inquiry to the first and second commentaries that Grossman and Kaplan delineate. Boys and men must embody a restricted series of traits to pass as normal males. Furthermore, they must follow a specific developmental path, lest they be doomed to a feminized psychic death, as she calls it. Against these tendencies, Corbett emphasizes in a 2002 essay that the phenomena of male homosexuality is a particularly productive realm for the psychoanalytic exploration of symptomatic notions about sexuality and gender within psychoanalysis itself. Thus, his project is analogous to that of Grossman and Kaplan with their emphasis on Freud's three commentaries on female sexuality. Corbett draws upon the protean nature of Freud's own phrase, the mystery of homosexuality, to frame his thesis. Quote, reflecting the manner in which solutions to mysteries are sought in an effort to restore certainty, analysts have repeat repeatedly attempted to dislocate homosexuals within a theory of gender that re rests upon essential distinctions between what is feminine and what is masculine. Perhaps the best illustration of this dislocation is the manner in which the male homosexual has been regarded as feminine." Unquote. Conceptualizing male homosexual, homosexuality as inherently feminine and therefore pathological, in contrast with an inherently masculine heterosexuality in men that must repudiate the feminine, constitutes a prime example of trait psychology masquerading as psychoanalytic theory. This kind of normative message that Grossman and Kaplan critique as, quote, social interventions underwritten by psychoanalytic authority, unquote. Such a message interferes with a psychoanalytic inquiry into the complex interplay between masculinity and femininity within heterosexual and homosexual men. The complexity of this terrain only magnifies with the inclusion of men who identify as bisexual or the kind of psychical bisexuality that Freud locates within all men and women, a point he stresses at many times in his writings, including in analysis terminable and interminable. Corbett further elaborates on the way in which this trait psychology conflates homosexual men and heterosexual women based quote, on what analysts saw as a similarity between the passive mode of sexual satisfaction desired by both, unquote. This confusion of categories leads to the following de-differentiating equation. Quote, male homosexuality equals passivity equals femininity equals trauma, unquote. In other words, according to these kinds of formulations, all gay men must have at some point in time suffered a catastrophic blow to their male gender identities, that psychic death. 
leaving them absolutely bereft of any sense of subjective agency or sexual potency as men. A more open-minded encounter with the sexual lives of gay men reveals a reality of complex variability that no trait psychology can encompass. Corbett, in his extensive clinical work with gay men, does indeed find passive longings and passive receptive sexual activities in many of his homosexual patients. And while these forms of passivity are sometimes a source of conflict, they can also be a polyvalent source of sexual pleasure and relational connection. Furthermore, Corbett notes that for gay men, quote, passive wishes do not negate the possibility of coexisting active wishes, unquote. He points to mutual fellatio between men to suggest that, quote, an individual could simultaneously experience activity and passivity, unquote, although any number of sexual act acts could combine these instinctual polarities. Importantly, Corbett points out that the manifest activity or passivity of a particular sexual act should not be confused with the underlying fantasies that fuel it. Indeed, to apply the psychoanalytic mode of thought to gay male sexuality would require openness to unexpected combinations of drive, defense, fantasy, and manifest activity and or passivity at conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious levels of mental life. Viewing gay, man, gay men as inherently passive or castrated or pseudo-female does a massive disservice to gay men everywhere. It also undermines psychoanalysis itself. Corbett's frank discussion of gay male sexuality and its various meanings in terms of sexuality and gender leads him to a statement that clearly challenges Freud's concretized notions concerning the psychical bedrock in men. Quote, Herein lies the heart of the mystery. Gay men move between passive and active sexual aims that do not reflect the kind of binary tensions falsely associated with heterosexual masculine activity and feminine passivity." Unquote. To think psychoanalytically about gay male sexuality would require a serious consideration of any number of variable modes of sexuality and gender that do not conform to more conventional formulations. Here is but a small sample of such variable modes. One, a gay man who enjoys both penetrative and receptive anal sex. Two, a gay man who exclusively takes pleasure in the physical domination of other men, a domination which may or may not include penetrative anal sex. Three, a gay man who exclusively enjoys receptive anal sex, yet goes about fulfilling these desires with a powerful dominating force. And four, a gay man who willingly and passively submits to his partner's aggressive anal penetration and who is able to maintain an erection throughout the sexual act and at time reaches orgasm without manual stimulation. This list is only meant to gesture towards the complex variability that can be found in gay male sexuality. By taking into account the multiple fantasies, conscious, preconscious, and unconscious, that could accompany such sexual acts, the complexity increases. In addition, any number of developmental formulations would have to be considered to account for such complexity. Grossman and Kaplan's third commentary on sexuality and gender Freud's psychoanalytic mode of thought is required to do justice to the richness of gay male sexuality, just as it is required for a thinking of female sexuality beyond the constraints of penis envy. Corbett's exploration of the mystery of homosexuality in light of a contemporary openness to homosexual variability effectively displaces the simplistic trait psychology and developmental thinking present in Freud's work as well as many of Freud's followers. At the same time, Corbett writes about Freud in particular as if his work only manifests Grossman and Kaplan's first two commentaries. In other words, Corbett fails to see how Freud steps beyond the limitations of his own thinking when he applies the psychoanalytic mode of thought to his own previous formulations. While Freud did arrive at a more pessimistic view regarding the repudiation of femininity in men in analysis terminable and interminable, 
that does not mean that his final words should be taken as the most valuable words on the subject. On the contrary, a psychoanalytic interpretation of Freud's contributions would consider other moments in his writings for dissenting perspectives. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip my second to last section, which looks at instincts and their vicissitudes and the work of Alan Bass to explore a, a more complex way of thinking about Freudian drive theory. I'm going to go to my conclusion um, and say this. How does the clinical practice of psychoanalyzing various manifestations of sexuality and gender change when the psychoanalytic mode of thought is kept in mind? To conclude this essay, I now return to the analysis of my composite patient, Sean, in order to offer some provisional responses to the question. As Sean's analysis progressed, the elucidation and interpretation of his maternal identification and all of its inhibiting functions played a key role. As Sean worked through these dynamics, his own form of masculine protest emerged in the form of a negative paternal transference. Sean became convinced that I was more interested in dominating and, explo and exploiting him for my own pleasure than in actually helping him analytically. Furthermore, he experienced himself as completely beholden to me, trapped in a state of frightened, hostile passivity. The painstaking analysis of this transference configuration ultimately revealed a deep desire in Sean to be cared for by the father analyst in a manner that did not eventuate in a seduction that would, in his fantasy, destroy us both. Thus, Sean's analysis required a sustained interpretive response to submissive fantasies involving both maternal and paternal objects. Rather than leading us to some kind of psychical bedrock, the shifting of these dynamics actually revealed the intensity of Sean's phallic drives, in which he desired to manifest his own phallic power and possess the phallic power of another man. The potential for these urges was always implied in the split-off, action-oriented sexual compulsivity that plagued Sean since his early adolescence. However, it was only in the non-normative analysis of Sean's phallic urges via interpretation and reconstruction that a radical difference in conceptualization could emerge. For example, early on in his analysis, Sean recollected that he enjoyed dressing up in his older sister's underwear. As this material emerged, it brought to my mind all of the traditional formulations about the dangers for young boys related to fantasies of an engulfing, castrating mother, Shesagre Shmergal, for example. It was several years later when he revealed that he did not experience himself as feminine while wearing the sister's underwear. Rather, he enjoyed wearing them because they bore a striking resemblance in his mind to the kind of briefs worn by the professional wrestlers he enjoyed watching on the TV. Ultimately, given the principle of multiple determination, interpretations of fantasies organized around both phallic and castrated attitudes played a crucial role in the working through of this kind of material. That said, the effective analysis of a broader range of Sean's dynamics would not have been possible without a willingness to consider the partial applicability of more traditional psychoanalytic formulations around self-castrating feminization in such a manner that did not foreclose more unexpected manifestations of Sean's phallic power. In fact, the more I learned about Sean's relationships to his sisters and girlfriends during his childhood, the more I came to understand that his enjoyment in playing with them defied stereotype notions about what it means for a young boy to engage in play primarily with girls. Although I initially imagined Sean playing with dolls and dollhouses with these various girls, much to my surprise, I was eventually informed that the activities of choice for this gang of kids included tree climbing and racing around self-made obstacle courses in the woods on their bikes. Various injuries were commonplace. Furthermore, as this rough and tumble play activity came to light, Sean began to remember the erotic quality of his play with girls 
including the various forms of pleasurable sexual experimentation that took place with one particular girl. I do not bring up this material to imply that Sean's anxiety around playing with boys during his childhood did not merit analysis. Clearly it did. I bring it up to foreground how I was listening to Sean at a certain point in the analysis with an unquestioning attitude about the meanings of his play with girls and that the analytic process itself brought to light not only the limitations of my formulations, but also my inability at a certain point to think about them critically. I realized in retrospect that I had been unwilling to consider Sean's sexual interest in girls as it did not fit into how I had been thinking about his sexuality and gender identifications. At a certain point, however, the greater complexity of his psychic life became inescapable and I had to reevaluate what I thought I knew about Sean. Although I should have seen it coming, as I worked through my initial blindness to Sean's bisexuality, I was ultimately able to interpret from a greater openness to the polymorphous potentiality of Sean's sexuality. The trait psychology and developmental thinking that I have critiqued in this paper cannot do justice to Sean's idiosyncratic, non-symptomatic modes of phallic pleasure with its complex mixture of activity and passivity as it has emerged over the course of his analysis. At the same time, certain ideas about traits and development inevitably found their way into the treatment, both from me and from Sean. Furthermore, these ideas did not always take the form of consciously conceptualized theories about sexuality and gender. Rather, it was only through a sustained analytic process that various unconscious fantasy-based convictions about sexuality and gender in the patient and the analyst could be worked through via interpretation. To apply the psychoanalytic mode of thought to analytic practice requires a, will, a radical willingness to question any received notions, conscious, preconscious, and unconscious, about sexuality or gender or psychoanalysis itself within the clinical process. Thank you. That was an extraordinary paper. Thank you very much. I think we'll hold all questions until after our two respondents. Uh, Dr. Rosemary Balsam is a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, London, associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine, staff psychiatrist at the Yale Student Mental Health and Counseling Service, and training and supervising analyst at Western New England Institute for Psychoanalysis. She is the author of numerous writings, including Women's Bodies and Psychoanalysis, published in 2012 by Routledge. Dr. Robert Smith is a training and supervising analyst and chair of curriculum here at the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute, where he teaches the course on Freud's final model of the mind. He has also taught in the psychology externship and psychotherapy programs and was the associate director of the Nipsey Treatment Center for 14 years. Dr. Smith is clinical instructor at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where he teaches the introduction to psychotherapy technique course to the second year residents. Currently involved in an effort to implement a new curriculum at this institute, Dr. Smith is working with Dr. Mark Solms and others to integrate neuropsychoanalysis further into the NIPSI curriculum. Dr. Balsam. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, to read such a terrific paper. And his excellent presentation with the case of a young gay man, Sean, who complains of a driven sexuality. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, and whose inner world convincingly, um, I, just for speed, I'm going to say Dr. K when I mean Dr. Kloppenberg, and Dr. G when I'm talking about Dr. Grossman. So. Um, so Dr. K starts to describe this form, childhood formed around a too close and sexually seductive mother married to an emotionally distant father. But Dr. K has cleverly led us up a primrose path. 
Abruptly, he breaks off this too ready dynamic formulation to challenge this commonly described construction of gayness in men, which has been used stereotypically as if in itself it were causal of their homosexuality. This familial formulaic pattern, as Shatsque and Smear Gell, for example, and many others have described, refers to an inner scenario of the psychologically engulfing mother with whom the son is controlled and over-identified. His own masculinity is thus subjected to her so-described femininity, inflamed further by his father's so-called impotent masculinity, passivity, and lack of power to rescue the now potentially gay boy from his mother's overwhelming influence. A negative Oedipal pattern is thus assumed to be staged where the boy's otherwise apparently normal heterosexual masculinity has been sabotaged and subverted by a woman. Um, there's a lot about this too that um, reeks of kind of misogyny and its repetition and rigidities. Dr. K then uses the limitations of this dynamic formulation to open to the work of the late William Grossman who had many incisive and interesting things to say in his textual analyses, thinking about, thinking about Freud's original theory, especially as it related to female development. Female development, as well as gay, lesbian, transgender development, we know have suffered from amalgamating into classical psychoanalytic theory the value judgments and cultural stereotypes, closed thinking, and the promotion of a monolithic approach to the theory building of gender. Around the 1970s and the second wave of feminism and the upsurge of interest in postmodern criticism, they all combined to undermine all such assumptions. Heterosexuality was shown to be used in psychoanalysis and elsewhere as the yardstick of normality against which to measure deviant other sexualities, preferences, and lifestyles. A monolithic psychoanalytic gender sensibility, though, had happened more, I think, as a climate of professional opinion in our field among Freud's followers. It had coalesced into a stasis of foregone conclusions in spite of all the self-protestations in the writings of Freud himself. He famously declared himself at times on a dark continent with women's inner lives, had overtly oscillated between certainty and doubt, though admittedly some smug certainty often prevailed implicitly against his proffered sardonic expressions of doubt about females, but I think he was a genuine doubt, and he had made clearly contradictory statements about male development and homosexuality in addition. And in the background, and still is, Freud's enduring work on sex and gender in the playful 1905 Three Essays on Sexuality, written in his beginnings, before he dealt in international organizational politics and measured loyalty to him and the movement, as he called it, Dizacha, by the testimony of unquestioned belief in the centrality of the Oedipal complex, and thus, as far as females were concerned, which was built into this, the fact, as he actually wrote about in a reified fashion many times, the fact of female castration. Not so in the early three essays. That lively account of the infantile roots of sexuality in search of the abiding question, where do babies come from, is an oasis which most modern psychoanalytic writers on gender and sexuality return to be refreshed. Dr. Kay's final freeing 214 clinical realizations about Sean's polymorphous sexual development likely owe a boost from those early insights of 1905 Freud. A later strange kind of dichotomous rigidity in psychoanalytic ideas about sex and gender occurred during Freud's lifetime. The kind of thinking that Dr. K despairs about here in his examinations of such polarizations as masculinity slash femininity or notions of active versus passive as categorically applied to gender difference. 
the history of this traditionally, traditionally rigid style, which in fact also denotes an internal portrait of a one-sex theory, uh, I'm referring to Thomas Lecour's work, together with the history of those analysts like Horney and others who had different ideas from Freud is totally fascinating to me, and I believe it is extremely relevant to the theory building and conduct of clinical analysis in these matters of gender that Dr. K brings for discussion this evening. Such consideration offers an alternative angle on the so-called concrete aspects of theory building that are, in fact, I think, rather despised by Dr. Grossman who recommends that they be set aside and dismissed as merely trait psychology. The latter, he averts, opposes Freud's true and the psychoanalytic mode of thought. And I'm always a little bit allergic to anything that's the psychoanalytic, but the psychoanalytic mode of thought. And this is commentary three, which is one stripped of the standardized gender traits or a sense of contamination from commentary two, in which Freud had styled his psychosexual developmental growth patterning. Now, the virtues of commentary three, by contrast with one and two, doctors Grossman, Kaplan, and Kloppenberg see as maximally capable of flexible extrapolation to constitution, individual family dynamics, trauma, contextualization within the interstices of transformations of mental processes alone. Dr. Kay's important aim in the revival of Grossman's representation of Freud's true emphasis on mental processes in the third commentary versus Freud's interest in greater sex and gender specificities, I think, is a plea that is highly laudable for openness to what our patients are trying to tell us about their own individuality and sexuality and gender, and enhanced hearing and understanding in less defensive ways than were represented formerly and often in our literature. I applaud the same and the consideration of Grossman's ideas, but I believe there are other paths to this goal, even paths that refreshingly share, and I love this part of Dr. Kloppenberg's paper, share with Grossman and Kloppenberg the supreme value of Freud's original contributions. I compare Grossman with Lowalt, for example, and I understand from, I hadn't realized how interested you also were in Lowalt. Huh? Um, almost matching quotations about the working psychic apparatus. To listen to Bill Grossman, Donald Kaplan's 1988 take on the nonlinear version, and as uh, quoted by Dr. K. The force of recursive translations, both within and between various organizational stratifications, must always be thought concurrently with the counterforce of defensive processes. The inevitable conflicts between these forces and counterforces create the unavoidable psychic tensions of life. Hans Lowalt always in close dialogue with Freud too, opens for an open and recursive system of motivational forces and dynamic spiraling organization, but by placing at the heart of his model the vision of a mother in constant reciprocity with an infant who is subject to her every stroke, caress, or depressive state as this infant emerges and develops and grows from a primitively inchoate state of fusion with her. Listen, though, to his very similar 1960 vision to Grossman's. Quotes, we arrive at the following formulation. The organization of the psychic apparatus beyond discernible potentialities at birth proceeds by way of mediation of higher organization on the part of the environment and infantile organism. In one and the same act, I'm tempted to say in the same breath and the same suckling of milk, drive direction and organization of environment into shapes and configurations begin, and they are continued into ego organization and object organization by methods such as identification, introjection, projection. The higher organizational state of the environment is indispensable 
for the development of the psychic apparatus and in early stages has to be brought to it actively. Without such a differential between the organism and environment, no development takes place. With low alt and non-linear patterning that builds through integration and disintegration of inner experiences, carries a developmental striving of the ego of the growing child into adulthood towards autonomy and selfhood. Lowell's work has been hailed by Greenberg and Mitchell in 1983 as the beginnings of intersubjectivity. Dr. Grossman also would see Freud pushing towards an intersubjective model. But where Grossman, to my ear, radically dissects off the sexed human in his environment, I think, to arrive at a third uncontaminated abstract commentary that he detects hidden deeply within Freud's rather more gutsy and messy account of men's and women's minds, their traits, their development, replete totally with his own objectionable personal value judgments. Lowald emphasizes as more central than Grossman the interactive objects of the individual's inner world and environment, the capacity for internalization that for Lowald would open to the cultural difference, gender difference, and all manner of enacted play-like scenarios. Interestingly, this take, which I think is closer to Ken Corbett's and my own too, could see a little regretfully Grossman's dismissal of what he calls the concrete and its application in the Freudian oeuvre in the commentary one. The quest for broader categories and openness has been spurred on too by somebody like Nancy Chadero in the early feminist socialist reproduction of mothering and later as a psychoanalyst her blazer lectures in 1994, femininities, all in the plural masculinities, sexualities, Freud and beyond. And many other writers and thinkers um, like Adrian Harris in her Gender, A Soft Assembly, or her talk about tomboys is very like the girls that Sean was interested in, or Muriel Dimon with postmodern emphasis, Julia Kristeva too, in her unique version of Lacan, Jerry Fogel, Michael Diamond's My Father Before Me, Donald Moss's 13 Ways of Looking at a Man, and importantly, Ken Corbett's Boyhoods, Rethinking Masculinities and whose work is featured very much in the paper today. These are all very, in some ways, um, you know, we have to struggle with the word concrete sometimes in these uh, descriptions that they give. And my own thought liberation through this history of the female body in psychoanalysis and a critique of the detail of Freud's role as a theoretician against dissidents in the fossilization of gender theory, which is what happened, which critique I think can be accomplished while preserving the verve and interest of Freud's method to access the unconscious and fantasy life about the body. I think for many theoreticians, and people here may not may disagree very much with this, theoreticians such as Rappaport, Edelson, as well as Bill Grossman, a bodily basis of Freudian theory can suffer from a kind of intellectual denigration attached to the adjective concrete that denotes a déclassé, crude, primitive thinking about the external as opposed to, for example, the adjective archaic, which supposedly signals the hallowed space of the internal. Bill and I disagreed about this mildly in a very friendly way when he was alive, much as I admired enormously his thinking, his brilliance, his rigor and openness. I think he, I think he would have us somehow transcend this level of critique and or corrections of Freud's offered erroneous work on the body as a waste of time, bypass it and go straight to the heart of his majestic contribution of the description of mental process. In the 1987 um, New York Institute symposium that occurred, and I think Frank Bowdry took part in this, so he may know a lot more about it than I do, that um, to study Grossman and Kaplan's three commentaries, I note that Susan Shirkout too questioned 
Grossman's representation that supposedly truly following Freud in deconstructivist mode that absolutely every element offered by a patient about sex and gender was reducible and fluid. And I'm quoting from Dr. Grossman now. In this area of many misunderstandings, he said, I'm not suggesting that there is some innate, inherent, or inevitable meaning attached to being a boy or girl, however much this may seem to be to the child, or indeed to most adults. Dr. Sherko, as I do, wanted to assert, would want to assert that actually females and males have very different bodies that have irreducible features unless medically altered and that shape their mentalized reactions and that we need to take that shaping very seriously into account working with patients. Now to the more clinical part, and I uh, admire very much Dr. Kloppenberg's um, uh, elegant detail in echoing Grossman's work. And then when he comes to the clinical material, he shows this ideal attitude clinically. And he puts his money where his mouth was. <laughs> when he returns to the actuality of the analysis of the patient, Sean, as he brings to the fore more detail of the maternal relation, I was struck by his, particularly by the account of the detail of the young boy's cross-dressing in the panties of his sister. This attraction on his part was not to become the sister or anything much female at all, rather to wear these briefs that to him looked like male wrestler's briefs. Surely if one needed stereotypes, an iconic image of tough manhood. Dr. K points out therefore the complexity of such behavior that suffers nothing more than a rush to judgmental stereotype sometimes a manifestation of negative counter-transference to such a young boy's behavior. And Janice Lieberman's telling us not to rush to metaphor too quickly uh, also helps us in this quest for individuality. The young boy is simultaneously imaginatively close to the body of a male wrestler in an erotically exciting way and perhaps interested in assuming his phallic power inside those briefs all in the boy's fantasy world, which indeed, of course, is the creation of this individual and not a generic gender portrait. This vignette is akin to one in a tool. One paper I wrote about in integrating male and female elements in a woman's gender life, where a female patient in her 20s, who was a world-class athlete, associated to her burgeoning muscles and bodybuilding Early associations came in conjunction with her father's athleticism and bulging biceps, but soon also were amalgamated into images of mother's expanding belly in her pregnancies and the power of the female body to fill up strongly, just as did my female patient's own muscles. I pointed out how a stereotypic interpretation would have formulated only the girl's penis envy of her father. And what a trap it is to follow the lead of any analyst who knows that a girl with muscles is merely trying to be a man or a boy in girls' panties is merely trying to be a woman. These would indeed be the traps of Grossman's trait psychology, which I think it's not the traits themselves, it's the abuse of the traits and the value judgments that I think are really the problem. So, um, I don't think that the analytic mode of thinking in any way obliterates the power of the foundational psychological misinterpretations of the female body that Freud fell prey to and affects the tenet. The ego is first and foremost a bodily ego. Had Freud from the beginning been able to grasp that a girl is born into her own anatomical body as a boy is born into his, or I suppose <clears throat> if he were to have constantly exercised the deconstructive tools that Brian and Bill highlight in commentary three, we'd have been saved a lot of professional heartache. Ken Corbett, I believe, sees the male as first and foremost a male not to be compulsively compared to females. That's what appeals to me, 
and also makes him different from Freud. From that vantage point then, if you don't have a compulsion to compare them, it's easy to question the adjective masculine for its meanings. Corbett's analytic interest can then focus on how an individual male receives, uh, finds himself in his surround. Um, here's a brief example um, of one way. I mean, it's terribly um, uh, abbreviated and almost kind of uh, caricatured, but forgive me. One sophisticated gay analyst sand of mine, a medical student at the time, wept recurrently and pleaded with me often. But how do I know that I'm a man? And in parenthesis, that would be if I'm gay, was the implication. Or he'd say it on occasion. The transference implication was that I should tell him what a manly man was, whatever that is. And I'd know for sure. And eventually, I mean, I can't, I did an enormous amount of work in various ways with him, but eventually I said, you know, the fact that you have a penis makes you a man. You seem to doubt that. And he said, a penis? And he sounded kind of baffled. And I said, well, I mean, don't you look at it? I mean, don't you ever also like look in the mirror? And there was a big silence. And he said, you know, I've never really looked at my own naked body. Of course I masturbate, but I never really looked at my penis or my body or actually even thought about it. Now, of course, there's plenty to analyze there, but I think if my theory had told me that material reality of his anatomically sexed body was just the same kind of thing, which Grossman uh, quotes at some point, as deconstructible as every attitude, fantasy, or manifestation of desire may be, genuinely very uh, deconstructible, I'd really not have, I wouldn't have thought of him looking at his own body and wondering what he saw. So our theories do guide what we say, whether or not we're consciously thinking of them. Now, Sean, for example, came to Dr. K with complaints, with complaints about his driven sex acts. I could imagine spending time as did Dr. K too, and he does very beautifully work, I think, with the, deconstructing the meanings, memories, creating, and I don't believe in the reification of memory either, creating in my mind at least tentative reconstructions of the probable bodily part objects of his erotic arousal. Now, would my privileging of his body have led me to pick up on his activity with his sister's panties, rather than selecting my listening more to follow the line of the inevitable engulfing mother? Uh, well, I think privileging the body has its possibilities. I, I think that's where I might well have gone. And since my definition of a male, and Ken Corbett's too, I think, needs only that he possess a penis and presumably the accompanying biology, um, even Ken's opening gambit, all boyhoods are different, but he doesn't question the fact that these are all boys. This is not, a, these, I totally agree with all this stuff about feminine boys as if they were girls. They're not, they're boys. <laughs> with no necess necessary adornment of the culture-laden adjectives till the boy himself adds them, there'd be little question that his own, whatever his own fantasy about his anatomical bottom was, would encode the leading edge of his motivational fantasy involving wearing her briefs. And I think it could well have led me to the same place as Brian, to male wrestlers and their tight buns and whatever their backsides as well as their front sides meant to Sean, because anality is also a very important and interesting issue about male homosexuality, that it's not that the anus is equivalent to a vagina. That's not so. So I would have ended probably in the same place, just by a different route. 
Now, in puzzling over our conceptual sameness and differences, and I'll <laughs> skip over this, but I was comforted to read in a recent book on metaphor by the literary critic Dennis Donahue, I thought of Dr. Grossman's and Kloppenberg's strong preference for the pure third commentary mental process as akin to Dennis Donahue's passion for what they, they call the Promethean imagination, where the author of the article said, quote, poets equipped with such powers evade the old bondage of exteriority, where some are unwilling to yield primacy to the object in any experience and purposed at every point to secure the artist's privilege. And the author goes on to say that Milton exemplified such subjective genius. So I'm comparing Bill Grossman and Brian Kloppenberg to Milton. And I'm <laughs> contrasting it actually with Robert Browning's description of Coleridge or Wordsworth quotes, the objective poet for whom there may be no end of poets who communicate to us what they see in an object with reference to their own individuality. I would say Don Moss is perfect with the 13 ways of looking at a man. But what it was before they saw it in reference to the aggregate human mind will be as desirable to know as ever. So I see Freud more in the Wordsworth and Cat the, that Coleridge way that I put Freud's interest in the human body as foundational to his theory in this restlessly searching place. But I think that Dr. Grossman and Kloppenberg think of him more as Milton and more of the um, poets that are equipped indeed to avoid an old bondage of exteriority. So on that note, I thank Dr. Kloppenberg for his fabulous paper and the chance to think together about these issues. I think I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna hold this, okay. So uh, of course, the part of uh, Dr. K's paper that he omitted is a significant portion of, uh, of what I discussed. So I'm just gonna read uh, one, uh, one paragraph from your di discussion of Bass's work. Uh, Bass's interpretation of Freud's theories of theory of the drives reveals an un unexpected mobility in psychic life at its mo most fundamental. Drive oscillations make possible disruptive shifts between active and passive, sadism and masochism, as well as scopophilia and exhibitionism. Bass adds to this list following Freud's exploration of periodic shifts between heterosexual and homosexual object choice and analysis terminable and interminable, the possibility of mobility at the level of sexual identity. In other words, Freud's theory of bisexuality implies that homosexual and heterosexual object choice, masculine and feminine identifications, can substitute for each other over time such that there could be discrete periods of heterosexuality and homosexuality in an individual's life. I just wanted to read that. Um, interestingly, uh, my, my comments in some ways uh, are related uh, in a conceptual way to Dr. Uh, balsams, uh, although the content's quite different. Um, I also want to thank Dr. K for explicating uh, important aspects of the underappreciated work of Dr. Bill Grossman in his examination of the psychoanalytic approach to sexuality and gender. Um, though I was fortunate to learn from many great teachers during my training here at NIPSI, some of whom are here tonight, Bill stood out for his erudition, generosity, and the originality of his thinking. Uh, there, it was really an incredible experience to be in his class. Um, for those who would like to learn more about his work, Dr. Arnold Wilson published an excellent introduction to it entitled Theorizing About Theorizing, an examination of the contributions of William I. Grossman to psychoanalysis, that's in JAPA. That's a paper that, like Bill's contribution on Freud's presentation of the psychoanalytic mode of thought, was first given here in this auditorium. 
Dr. Wilson pointed out that Grossman's papers must be understood as a whole because they map onto one another such that core ideas threading their way from paper to paper are often hidden beneath the surface. For this reason, my discussion will refer to other papers written by Dr. Grossman in addition to those stressed by Dr. K. I agreed with much of what Dr. K had to say. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I disagreed with for the purpose of stimulating discussion. In rejecting Freud and Bass's theory of bisexuality, I will argue that there's a biological contribution to sexual orientation that must be taken into account in constructing a developmental theory of homosexuality. I will also suggest that while it's true that normative ideas and notions of bedrock can lead to anachronistic thinking and destructive treatments, we cannot practice analysis without them. Finally, I will address the philosophical issues upon which these questions are based as part of an analysis of the process of theorizing as manifested in Dr. K's paper. In the opening phase of the analysis of Sean, Dr. K finds himself wondering if Sean's powerful maternal identification interfered with his ability to connect with his father resulting in a childhood trauma that severely derailed the development of his phallic and edible strivings and possibly led to his becoming homosexual. This line of thinking conceptualizes homosexuality as a pathological failure of development. Dr. K then recalls Grossman and Kaplan's description of the psychoanalytic mode of thought and in doing so appropriately calls into question any clinical formulations based on traits and developmental narratives as necessarily partial and provisional. In order to investigate Dr. K's point about trait psychology further, we need to examine the underlying assumptions upon which the trait psychology view of homosexuality were built. In Hartman and the Integration of Different Ways of Thinking, Dr. Grossman quoted Freud's statement that, quote, scientific activity does not begin with ideas taken from observation alone, but with ideas taken from other sources. In this case, Freud was speaking of his need to borrow the drive concept from biology. Grossman added that in the case of Freud, Hardman, and us, we span a century of psychoanalysis, which began with Freud's interdisciplinary orientation, with Hardman in the middle of the 20th century developing his interdisciplinary framework, while today this interdisciplinary orientation has taken form in the New York Psychoanalytic Institute's Center for Neuropsychoanalysis. I mentioned this well, because, of course, I'm very interested in developing this, but also because Freud's model of psychosexual development begins with constitutional bisexuality, a concept that he did not initially derive from clinical data, but took from Wilhelm Fleiss, who served as the transference object for Freud's self-analysis. After positing that bisexuality is the starting point of psychosexual development, Freud concluded that adult genital heterosexuality, which he viewed as the normative final phenotype, was an achievement which could be derailed at various nodal points, especially during the resolution of the Oedipal phase. Friedman and Downey have observed that his theory that unconscious heterosexual wishes were universal led to the erroneous belief that the sex of the consciously experienced erotic object could be altered by psychoanalysis. At the same time, Freud's model of development did not allow for a normal pathway to adult homosexuality, even though he did make many other comments suggesting that he viewed homosexuality as not pathological, as you pointed out. His model does not allow for normal development, so that's what I'm focusing on, his model of development. Um, and we have to keep, I want you to keep in mind the distinction between psychoanalysis as a theory of mind and as a clinical technique. Um, so how can we develop a theory to account for such a pathway? This is where non-analytic findings can be helpful. While there is clinical evidence for psychic bisexuality, there is no psychoanalytic evidence for constitutional bisexuality in terms of final sexual object choice. In contrast, evidence from modern neuroscience and epidemiology suggests that innate factors influence sexual orientation. I suspect that the predisposition to homosexuality exists along a wide spectrum and see the final sexual footprint as the result of a complemental series which includes constitutional, developmental, and cultural factors. 
the neuroscientist Simon LaVey has found that the third of four functional groups of neurons called the interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus is three times larger in heterosexual men than in women or homosexual men. The anterior commissure, which connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain, is larger in women and gay men than in straight men. Of course, the fact that there's a difference between the brains of gay and straight men does not prove that a major factor influencing sexual orientation is genetic. There is evidence for the existence of a gene which affects sexual orientation. Homosexuality runs in families with a 50% concordance rate in monozygotic twins and a 25% rate in dizygotic twins. That's separated at birth. The most compelling evidence supporting the idea that prenatal factors help determine sexual orientation is the fact that the greater the number of older brothers a man has, the greater the chances are that he will be gay. This is true even if the younger brother is raised in a different family. The mechanism that has been suggested is that the more often a mother is exposed to the Y chromosome, the more likely she is to develop antibodies to HY antigens on it, which affect the antibodies then affect fetal brain development. Now, there's a big debate within the gay community about this issue. Uh, opponents of the innate hypothesis have questioned the methodology of all of these studies. And some of them do have methodological problems. But taken together, uh, and especially the data about the older siblings, uh, but the other data also, um, suggests that there are multiple biological pathways that contribute to the development of a homosexual orientation and raise the possibility that at least for some people, sexual orientation is a kind of bedrock. And it's likely treated that way in many analyses, though of course there are some individuals whose sexual orientation is fluid. Um, and even the fact that the attempt to convert gay people to be, make them straight failed is further evidence of this. Um, and I'm not saying there are, there are not people that are bisexual. There clearly are. I'm talking about a majority, though. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's complex. It, it, but nonetheless, my clinical experience does not support Bass's implication that mobility at the level of sexual identity is possible for most people. The debate within the gay community between the postmodern social constructionists like Kohler and the natural scientists like Friedman about whether homosexuality is partially innate depends in part upon whether one views being part of a minority as evidence of pathology or simply of difference. In Dr. K's clinical example, Sean was excited by girls during his childhood, but there was no sense that as an adult, his sexual orientation was an issue in his analysis. Similarly, heterosexual people not infrequently report homosexual wishes or activity during development, yet usually wind up without serious doubt about their orientation as adults. Though Freud's idea about what constitutes bedrock were incorrect, this does not mean that bedrock defined in a slightly different way, as a biologically determined limitation on what is possible in the fully formed adult is not a viable concept. I'm not arguing for a simplistic biological determinism. I'm saying that we can't ignore the influence of the biology, just like we can't ignore the influence of the body um, in developing a comprehensive theory of mind. For those analysts who continue to find the concept of the Oedipus complex useful in their clinical work, we need ways to conceptualize Oedipal development in a boy who is constitutionally or constitutionally and developmentally homosexual. It could be an interaction between a constitution and early experience. One narrative has been proposed by I say, where the boy, his father senses that he's, the boy is erotically drawn to him and pulls away. Uh, but that, and that's and that's uh, is applicable in some cases. That's a developmental narrative, but a more general model, which assumes homosexual object choice from an early age, is provided by Scott Goldsmith. He astutely dissects the challenges faced by a homosexual edible boy who desires his father and competes with his mother. 
The boy faces an extra stressor because his behavior does not conform to the expectations of either parent. Auchincloss and Vaughn opine that we cannot develop a new developmental theory for homosexuality using data from psychoanalysis. Karen Gilmore uh, argued that data from developmental and other forms of extra analytic research can be integrated with clinical findings from the psychoanalytic situation using a nonlinear dynamic systems approach to create the most opposite theory. I feel that the most accurate and useful developmental theory combines insights derived from the analytic situation with extra analytic scientific findings that can constrain and inform the construction of a general theory of mind. A model of development which is consistent with that associated with the psychoanalytic mode of thought begins with constitutional factors, proceeds through phases with nonlinear transformations occurring at nodal points. The way the accidental events of childhood, such as strain, trauma, object relationships, etc., are experienced intrapsychically influence this dynamic process, which is governed by organizing concepts such as the reality and pleasure principles, continual defensive operations, which you referred to, drives or seeking systems, conflict and compromise formation. One of Dr. Grossman's core ideas was the application of the psychoanalytic mode of thought to the process of theorizing itself. He observed that behind the overt issue addressed in a psychoanalytic paper, a deeper controversy could be discerned. In addition, he felt that understanding the ideas of thinkers requires understanding their contexts. Dr. K, uh, we know, teaches about Heidegger. Now, Heidegger viewed, the late Heidegger viewed all of Western thought since Plato including the development of the natural sciences as a mistake. Um, the term non-normative in the title of tonight's presentation refers to Dr. K's useful critique of the egregious error committed by psychoanalysts influenced by the normative ideals of the zeitgeist Geist, uh, in which they were writing in defining homosexuality as pathological. It also implicitly raises the larger issue of whether analysts need some conception of normality in order to analyze patients effectively. This question is one manifestation of the division between the hermeneutic phenomenological, which is somewhat of a simplification, but nonetheless, versus the positivist enlightenment philosophical traditions, which underlie the major theoretical and political rifts currently active in psychoanalysis. I believe that both perspectives are important for our field, and both can be found in Freud's thought and in Dr. K's work, I would add. Velder pointed out, uh, as Dr. Leon Bolter reminded me, that each psychic function has multiple meanings and each meaning has multiple determinants. Also, I would add that the construction of a more adaptive narrative of an animal sense development could be seen as an essential aspect of therapeutic action in psychoanalysis, and the efficacy of this technique could ultimately be measured empirically. Um, I don't, I don't think that these two perspectives will ever be fully integrated, and I think that the fracturing of our field will continue. But I think that uh, an effort to integrate them is essential uh, for, for the future of our field. In order to demonstrate how and why these issues are clinically important, I will re-examine Dr. K's uh, clinical example. Sean was unhappy with the fact that his predilection for getting into sexual trouble prevented him from developing a loving, stable relationship and a more dynamic work life, implying that Sean considered this behavior to be abnormal. Now, Dr. K does not comment about whether or not he viewed it as abnormal. In my view, all analysts utilize some conception of normality in their work, though the way in which normality is defined varies considerably. Uh, for example, Donnell Stern was here recently. He might see the degree to which the patient dissociates as the major abnormality. Uh, Charles Brenner might view maladaptive compromise formations as the pathology that needs to change. And there are many others. I'd further argue that any psychoanalytic theory of psychopathology requires a developmental model to explain its genesis and also to allow for reconstruction. Dr. K uses developmental concepts such as 
maternal and paternal identification, phallic drives, reconstruction, and the Oedipus complex in his clinical work. It appears that his position in the philosophical debate I alluded to earlier is not dogmatic or unilateral, and I consider that to be a good thing. Dr. K states that it's common today for analysts to continue to believe in now discredited theories of homosexual development. I question whether this is the case or whether he, possibly influenced by Foucault's view of societal ideas about normality in the categories of sexuality and gender as expressions of repressive power and his own psychology, may be drawn to a narrative uh, in which he responds with radical, Dr. K responds with radical critiques to combat unempathic and sadistic authority figures who oppress gay men. At the same time, his thinking is balanced by an appreciation of Freud, Freud's own radical and liberating ability to question socially constructed norms. In trying to utilize the psychoanalytic mode of thought in examining his paper, I'm obligated to question my own assumption that most contemporary analysts no longer consciously hold outdated views of homosexuality as a possible expression of my own wish to idealize my teachers or deny my own unconscious homophobia. Perhaps such overt attitudes do persist, especially in some of those trained before analytic views of homosexuality, homosexuality began to evolve starting in the 1970s and 80s or an analyst with unresolved issues about their own sexuality. By the time I was a resident in the early 90s, homosexuality had been not defined as pathological by psychiatry for two decades, and I dismissed older ideas about homosexuality as pathology, along with other erroneous notions, such as the schizophrenogenic mother and the morally inferior women, woman. During my own training here at the famously conservative New York Psychoanalytic Institute in the 1990s, I don't recall any instructor or supervisor saying to me that homosexuality was pathological, though we did read older papers that reflected that view, and there were at that time no openly gay candidates. As I gained clinical experience, I observed that there was no single developmental pathway for gay or straight individuals, that some people whose masturbation fantasies in adolescence were primarily directed towards one sex were able to have sex with both men and women, while others were not, and that the final phenotype that sexuality assumed in adulthood varied considerably. While the Institute, when the Institute began to accept gay candidates, it seemed to demonstrate that we no longer overtly endorsed the view that homosexuality was pathological. Nonetheless, I do think that homophobia, like racism and sexism, is ubiquitous and that continual self-analysis is necessary to reduce its pernicious influence. Consequently, I view a different but related set of problems alluded to by Dr. K as currently more prevalent in analytic treatments of gay people. Um, these also involve conscious and unconscious attitudes towards sexuality and gender held by analysts. For some, the understandable wish to atone for the trauma inflicted by previous analysts who tried to change their orientation can result in the analyst taking an apologetic stance that interferes with the patient's ability to project his own homophobic views onto the analyst. This limits the possibility of analyzing the patient's self-condemnation effectively. In addition, the development of an erotic transference towards an analyst of the same sex as the patient may be inhibited by the analyst's unconscious homophobia or unresolved conflicted homosexual wishes, preventing the reconstruction via the transference of essential developmental vicissitudes. The issue of how the analyst countertransference can limit what the patient is able to experience in the transference is a manifestation of intersubjectivity, a concept that Freud first introduced in Totem and Taboo and to the two technical papers as part of the psychoanalytic mode of thought according to Grossman, although I will say I found that part of Grossman's paper the least convincing. Uh, he concluded that totem and taboo, nonetheless, was an important nodal point in the introduction of an emerging picture of the mind created and continuing to function in close connection to the object world in which it is linked with, by unconscious understandings of unconscious meanings, projections, and interjections. 
uh, almost finished. Um, Dr. K refers to intersubjectivity when he states that, quote, the complexity and, un and unpredictability of sexuality and gender gives rise to anxiety in both members of the psychoanalytic couple. Let us return to our clinical vignette and examine Dr. K's clinical work. We see him viewing Sh Sean at times from an empirical positive pers positivist perspective while engaging in self-analysis and questioning his assumptions in adopting the analytic attitude endorsed by Grossman. He's able to maintain an analytic stance while inhabiting the multiple roles Sean projected onto him. Via the analysis of the transference and the process of reconstruction, he was able to make surprising and transformative interpretations which resulted in significant improvement in Sean's ability to function. Dr. K changes his mind about the meaning of Sean's childhood play with uh, girls and the desire, his desire to dress up in his older sister's underwear after he hears further associations from his patient. There's nothing in this work that differs from what I would consider good analysis. Though Dr. K rejects normative ideas, in his clinical example, he implies that Sean's maternal identification interfered with his normal development. I would see Sean's negative paternal transference as a compromise formation that included his sexual and aggressive wishes towards his father, his wish to be loved by his father, and his defenses against these wishes. I would conceptualize Sean's sexual wish for his father as the normative positive pole of his Oedipus complex, consistent with Goldsmith's developmental model. I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Kloppenberg for his thought-provoking, sensitive contribution and for, brought, for providing us with this opportunity to discuss essential matters in psychoanalysis. Well, my only wish at this point is that we had another two hours for questions. Um, I will uh, happily pass the microphone to anyone who would like to pose a question. Hi, I just want to thank you guys. I'm a student, and it's really um, refreshing to hear dialogue about non-normative sexuality. Um, but I'm, I'm also struck by something that I feel that something, you know, we were talking about non-normative sexuality, but I feel that something was really left out as well, um, which is the notion of transsexuality and transgender people, and particularly in terms of embodiment, and the notion of um, sensuous knowledge and, you know, that transgender people often feel like they're in the wrong body. Um, so just kind of something, I guess, a challenge for all of us to think about in terms of our future work and that there's this big other chunk missing um, in the whole, it felt very binary, you know, heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, and kind of something was missing. But again, super encouraging. Um, I guess that's just my comment. <laughs> Would anyone like to comment on that? Well, I, I think it's a terrific um, comment and a great invitation. I think it's very much in its infancy. Um, the transgendered people don't come to psychoanalysts. You know, and I think that psychoanalysts, above all mental health professionals, are privileged to hear, we hear much more in four or five times a week, people trying to help them to associate and work with their defenses. And um, we are better equipped, to, we are equipped to hear more of these materials because we're m so much more open. I think this is right. And the younger people, the younger people are in our profession, I think the more open and interested they are. So I wish and I hope we just have more people that are transgendered. I, I mean, any, and I've had some experiences, but in psychotherapy and in shorter term in the Yale Student Health Services, there are plenty of transgendered people come and talk, but they tend to come and talk about one or two aspects of things. You know, I remember a girl that talked vigorously about her main complaint was that, uh, and it was a, she was she to start with, she sometimes referred to herself as she, sometimes he, 
and um, but that people didn't immediately appreciate the fact that she was in he she was in a female chorus but was wearing a male tuxedo and people drew attention to that and wondered about it and this um, young he she both <laughs> transgendered person was very angry about but you know she was very angry about a lot of things so Um, well, there are now transgender candidates and some transgender analysts, so it is moving. Um, and I actually have written a, a follow-up discussion to this paper addressing some of these issues. I, I think it's a, it's a vast topic. And um, I think it's important to, to find some kind of clarity and specificity in any one given project. Um, and I, I think there's much to be said about boys and girls and men and women um, and homosexuality and heterosexuality and bisexuality. Um, but that in the realm of, of transgender, I think that Grossman and Kaplan's thinking about the three commentaries actually is very useful. Um, I didn't actually intend to give the impression that I, I, I thought that developmental narratives were something we could somehow do without. Even if we might consciously wish to do so, I think there's a whole unconscious life that developmental thinking takes on. Um, and Grossman was excellent at indicating that. Uh, so, um, but I, I think that the danger is, especially nowadays, that we think, oh, well, we've moved on, and now we really understand what development is, and now we really understand what the traits are, um, or we promote new traits. Um, and of course, we're going to do this, but the danger is, is that we don't question it. So when we think about transgender, um, I think there are two responses that, that need to be looked at psychoanalytically. Um, and you actually reference this vis-a-vis -vis certain analysts who are uh, sort of counterphobic in their apologetic stance towards their gay male patients. Right? So one is to knee-jerk pathologize transgender people, and there's a whole literature that, well, it's not a very large literature, but it's primarily uh, one that locates an inherent pathology in transgender. Um, and the other one is a kind of um, attempt to rescue transgender from the pathological. Both, both sides have to be looked at analytically for what's useful and what's problematic. Right, so that's where I come back to perhaps an excessively cerebral approach. Um, but I think it's essential, actually, if we want to liberate the body in the way that I think psychoanalysis can. Uh, thank you. It was a really very interesting panel. I just want to follow up on something that Rob mentioned about the uh, differentials between men and women in terms of the brain development, homosexual uh, women versus heterosexual men. In his 1997 book, Jack Pongsep talks about uh, how many genders are there, and he says there's an infinite number, that you have to really look at the effect of the, of the uh, steroids on the brain and the effect of the steroids on the genitals, and you can have a whole variety of permutations. So in a way, this whole transgender issue uh, probably speaks to the really broad variety of um, male brain, female brain combinations versus male genitals, female genitals, and that there's, and I think it really is, I think Rosemary's comment is that psychoanalysts really are in the best the best possibility to study this in as most neutral way as possible, the really the varieties of biological underpinnings as well as the sociological impacts. But I thought it was really very interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, I'd also like to thank the, the panelists. It was really great. Uh, enjoyed it a lot. Uh, there's something that I, uh, I just want to uh, make a comment about, not really about Dr. Bolsom's presentation, but uh, more Dr. Smith. Uh, I, I think that your ideas about creating a, um, a broad psychoanalytic world are uh, laudable. I'm not sure, though, that the premises that you have in terms of getting there are the way we, uh, we want to go. And uh, if I'm, uh, I think, if I'm understanding Dr. Kloffenberg's presentation, what he's suggesting is that the boundaries of analysis really need to be made clear, that analysis is, uh, is in a state where it's kind of like in uh, Syria today, where might makes right. And if we don't make it clear what the boundaries of analysis are, then uh, we're going to get swept away. So the psychoanalytic mode of thought does not oppose an interdisciplinary dialogue. I don't think it opposes a trait psychology. I don't think it opposes a developmental psychology. But what it does do is make it clear what a psychoanalytic contribution is. And by making that boundary clear, it allows for the first time a real dialogue between psychoanalysis and the other disciplines, particularly trait psychologies and developmental psychologies. I would not disagree with you. I don't think what you said is actually in opposition to what I said. It added something. I, I agree that we need to define the boundaries of psychoanalysis, but we also have to be very explicit. Uh, psychoanalysis as a clinical method, and then psychoanalysis as a, a part of a, a general theory of mind and because I think that uh, psychoanalysis essentially abandoned that project after Hartman to its detriment. And, uh, and part of our, the fall of status of psychoanalysis within psychiatry and psychology and in the general society, uh, I think is related to that. So while I agree with you that it is useful to define the boundaries of psychoanalysis in terms of the, a way of thinking and also a clinical approach. At the same time, I think it's a grave mistake to uh, not embark on, also on a, uh, an endeavor in which we're trying to construct a general a theory of mind, which is still very much in its infancy and un, we're constantly questioning and revising, none of this is, but as these new findings come out of neuroscience with powerful tools that have been developed and, and, and other fields, uh, I think Freud would have been very interested in, in this, and I think it's, it's healthy for our field to, to attempt this kind of uh, integration. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree about, it, you know, I mean, it raises the interesting question of, well, what is psychoanalysis? And, you know, what is a boundary that um, one person might recommend? You know, it, uh, Freud had a larger boundary in mind, you know, as a theory of mind, as once you begin to talk about theories of mind. So it's debatable as to what are we talking about and if we're talking about um, a clinical approach and what's clinical theory I like the old the older view too that you could divide the clinical theory from the metapsychological theory I, I I too would like to go back to some of that with some of our newer um, I think uh, more um, 
uh, open, the, the a whole issue of individual value judgments, cultural value judgments, I think, are very serious issues for all of us, counter-transference issues and so on, and that, that those things limit our abilities to think. And, you know, once you open the ability to think, then what is the, is that the issue that we're interested in? promoting and psychoanalysis, in which case it becomes a little more even wider than the Grossmanian <laughs> definition. That's a, it's a wonderful definition of psychoanalysis, I think, but there are other. Well, I'd like to thank the uh, entire panel and particularly Dr. Kloppenberg for a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.